did you know that the great physicist Isaac Newton wrote more about theology than he did about physics, probably, and mathematics? Did you know that? Well, he did. Did you know that Louis Braille became blind at the age of three when he was working in his father's workshop? Uh, as a teenager, he became the church organist, which continued through his life. And he believed that developing the Braille alphabet for the blind was his God-given mission. On his deathbed, he said, I am convinced that my mission is finished on earth. I tasted yesterday the supreme delight. God condensed to brighten my eyes with the splendour of eternal hope. Beautiful. Did you know it's Christians that opened the first hospitals, the first public schools? Christians wrote the law to abolish slavery in the British Empire and influence the early labour movement. Few people are aware of the extent to which Christianity has changed our world. So today we begin our three-part uh, series looking at how Christianity changed the world, and it's based on this book. So you can go and buy that book if you like, How Christianity Changed the World, and at different times throughout the year, whatever, we might take another little block to look at some other spheres of how Christianity has influenced our, our world and our society so powerfully. So much for the book. And we'll return to biblical exposition after that. And I think we'll have a crack at the book, the Gospel of Luke. So there's a little bit of a heads up for this year. I'm doing this series because people don't know um, so much of this amazing history. I'm doing it because it's good to be informed and to appreciate how the gospel, the Judeo-Christian worldview, has transformed individuals. It has inspired their approach to their particular discipline for 2,000 years, from cosmology to social work. And also we'll get it because none of some of these things, I believe, encourages us when we realise the extent of how God has used these people. And therefore, it encourages us in our faith, and therefore, we can give God the glory he deserves, which is uh, really going unnoticed. Paul Meyer, a professor of ancient history, says, the Christian faith can be splendidly defended on another front. Its record of being the most powerful agent in transforming society for the better across 2,000 years since Jesus lived on earth. No other religion, philosophy, teaching, nation, movement, whatever, has so changed the world for the better as Christianity has done. Its shortcomings are heavily outweighed by its benefits to all and that happens because transformed people transform, transform their surroundings and the people around them. The evening before his crucifixion, when Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, his disciples lacked the stamina just to stay awake and comfort and be with Jesus. A few hours later, one of them will even deny knowing him. And the next morning, as Jesus was crucified, all of these disciples, except John, hid in fear. When Jesus died, it appeared that his disciples, that everything had come to an end. Seeing the fate of their master, they now feared for their own lives. Were they going to be next on that cross? And so they were scared. What they had the privilege of experiencing for the last three years now just seemed like a badly mistaken dream. And this 
amazing idealistic kingdom that Jesus spoke about is just going to be another footnote in history. So no one would have guessed at that time that these scared and grief-stricken men would just in a few years be accused of turning the world upside down by their preaching of Jesus Christ. But when the risen Jesus physically appeared to them, it transformed their fear and doubt. But it also enabled them to understand what Jesus had told them before his crucifixion. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. As witnesses to the resurrection, they now believe that just as Jesus had been raised from the dead, they too will be raised when they die and that they would live with their Saviour forever. Jesus' resurrection and his giving of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 not only transformed their understanding of Jesus' identity, it gave them power, gave them confidence and motivation to proclaim the gospel without fear. And so when they were threatened to keep quiet, they fearlessly replied, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So convinced and motivated were Jesus' disciples to continue sharing the life-giving gospel in the face of persecution that all except John faced violent, really horrific deaths. And millions more have followed since. David Barrett, researcher, estimates that 70 million Christians have been martyred in the last 2,000 years. Staggering number. And yet today, thousands more are killed each year and many, many thousands more are persecuted. Open Doors is an organisation that helps persecuted Christians. Each year they put out a list of the most dangerous places for a Christian to live. But I think it's beautiful what the CEO, David Curry, said. He said, you might think that the list of most dangerous countries is all about oppression. But the list is really all about resilience. The numbers of God's people who are suffering should mean that the church is dying, that Christians are keeping quiet, losing their faith and turning away from one another. But that's not what's happening. Instead, in living colour, we see the words of God recorded in the prophet Isaiah, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. History proves that despite persecution, people transformed by the gospel work and pray to make a way. The transformation of others and society by the gospel. It is the gospel that carries with it the power of transformation and the gospel begins with creation. And one of the most amazing and powerful truths in the creation account in Genesis 1 is that we are made in the image of God. It is amazing and powerful because being made in the image of God means that we have things in common with God. We Share stuff with God. That's an amazing idea. What things do we share? Well, God is creative. He's made us creative. We have a moral conscience. We can have empathy. We can stand in awe and beauty of creation. We ask why. We contemplate meaning and purpose. We record and then we reflect on history. 
that and so many other things, unlike animals, shows, these qualities show, and they reflect God and, and his image within us. But ultimately, they also allow us to relate to him and know him. Being made in God's image means that all persons have worth and dignity. It gives us the ability to reason and to see order in the universe around us. It also gives us the ability to understand something of God and give him the glory that he deserves. Only people can worship God. And so much flows from these three spheres, these three areas. If we look at the sphere of human worth, which, which is what we're looking at today, the, the, the sanctity of human life that comes from the Christian worldview, it's going to affect how we view people. It's going to shape how we think about dignity and respect and human rights. It will shape how we think about the value of human life in areas of disability, abortion, euthanasia, and palliative care. The Christian worldview will guide us when it comes to slavery and racism, how we think about giving aid, running hospitals, running prisons, and even how we fight wars. When we think of the second sphere, we see order and design in what God has created around us. And he has given us a desire for knowledge because we are the creatures that ask how and why. And all the different sciences, cosmology, biology, physics, chemistry, etc., can help, help us understand the how. While theology and sometimes philosophy can help us understand the why. In the third sphere, so much of the great art, the great architecture, great music and literature over the past 2,000 years has come from men and women creatively reflecting on the glory of God. These spheres reflect the importance of body, mind and spirit to the gospel and the Christian worldview. Now, a non-Christian can do science and can compassionately care for people. They are still made in God's image, still have those qualities to less or a greater degree like all of us. And whether they are aware or appreciate the fact that they are made in God's image or not. Yet apologists, apologists are people who make arguments uh, for the Christian worldview or they defend the faith, they would say that it's only the Christian worldview that can coherently and consistently through each of these five great existential human questions answer them uh, in that coherent way. So questions of origin. Where am I from? Questions of meaning. What really matters? Questions of morality. How do we live with each other? Questions of identity. Who am I? And questions of destiny. Where am I going? These are the five great questions that have been around and always have been. And it is Christianity that, that has a consistent, coherent answer to each of those. After creation, the second aspect of the gospel, especially if you're trying to share it with someone, is the painful and obvious reality of the fall. The fall is a term that refers to how the first humans went from living in paradise and in this perfect relationship with God to the world of corruption, crime, disease, wars and strife that we live in today. 
And the Bible is clear, very clear, that this is a consequence of every human, from Adam and Eve to you and I today, repelling, rebelling against God and his good order. The good news of the gospel is the antidote to the fall. It is a stark contrast and a certain hope. You see, despite the fact that we have violated, well, our own conscience, our own standards, we have broken God's heart, we have made him angry, and we have broken um, his heart as well, as well as his laws. He has taken gracious and loving initiative to come to us, to reach out through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the wonderful good news of the gospel. And so as we respond to that, as we come to him in humility, and confess the offence that we have caused him, he bears that offence upon himself. Jesus takes our sin and the punishment that it deserves. Well, he gives us his righteousness, his right standing before God. That is the most amazing transaction possible. That transaction is transforming. All who embrace that gospel of grace and continue walking obediently in it are being transformed. They are transformed in so many ways, in their righteous status before God. They are transformed in coming into relationship with him, in becoming one of his children. They are transformed in their eternal destiny from hell to being with their saviour in heaven forever. They are transformed in how they view the world and its people as they begin to see things through God's eyes. And so in that process, we are transformed in seeing things with spiritual eyes and we see that all things in this world matter as well. People and their bodies matter. Pain matters, doesn't it, Kath? Health, education, well-being, society, relationships, marriage, sexuality, work, leisure, time, money, everything is transformed when it is viewed from a Christian worldview. So when the first Christians arrived in Rome, they did not do as the Romans did. Just about everything about Rome contrasts with their Christian worldview. The pathetically low view of human life, reinforced by the pagan religion of the Romans, was a shocking affront to the Christians who had the exalted biblical worldview of all human life. Life was to be honoured and protected regardless of age, gender or level of ability. And one way that Christians demonstrated the sanctity of life was in active opposition to the widespread Greek and then Roman practice of infanticide, that is the killing of babies. The deformed, the frail and the female were especially prone to being killed off by being thrown into the Tiber River in Rome or just left there in ancient Greece, it was incredibly rare for a family to raise more than one daughter. Cicero, the Roman politician, said, according to the 12 tables of Roman law, 
deformed infants shall be killed. There are various early Christian writings that condemn infanticide. And Christians didn't just write about it, they acted upon it. was a Christian in Rome. Callistus was probably the first person to set up what we would call an adoption agency. He would find these abandoned children and place them in Christian homes to be raised. Beninus, I think I've got that pronunciation on it, of Dijon, housed abandoned and deformed babies before he himself was martyred for his faith. And when a lady by the name of Aphra became a Christian, she left prostitution, but she also developed a ministry to abandoned children of prisoners that were locked away to rot. This Christian influence on Rome slowly grew over the centuries until when in 374, Emperor Valentinian out infanticide and a child abandonment. But the bloodlust of the Romans for their entertainment in the Colosseum was also challenged by Christians. Thousands of children and adult Christians met an horrific end as half-starved lions were released upon them. And over the centuries, when Christians finally stopped being killed in this way, the gruesome gladiator fights to the death continued for people's viewing pleasure. Now, Telemachus was a monk who decided to stop the brutality and the contempt of human life in these gladiatorial contests. <laughs> Some say he walked either from Egypt or from Turkey, right around to Rome and into the Colosseum to stop it. And so he was there one time, and during a fight, he jumped into the arena amongst the gladiators. In fact, he came between the two gladiators, and he said, in the name of the Lord, I command you to stop this wickedness. The crowd were just baying for him to be killed. One of the gladiators knocked him to the ground. But he stood up again and he said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, stop this. As the crowd continued to chant for his death, a gladiator plunged his sword through Telemachus. A hush came over the 80,000 people in the Colosseum that day as Telemachus fell to the ground dead. One man in the crowd and he slowly walked out. And then another, and then another until the entire crowd of 80,000 people walked out of the Colosseum. With that heroic stand that cost Telemachus his life, he became the last lady of fight in the Colosseum. When paganism rules, another common practice is human sacrifice. The Lord condemned this practice of the Canaanites sacrificing their children to Baal. Israel was explicitly mentioned numerous times. And yet, this horror was even practiced by the kings of Israel. Proper archaeologists have discovered the remains of children sacrificed at the Temple of Ashtaroth during the time of King Ahaz and Queen Jezebel. 
And if you read through the book of two kings, you'll read there of King Ahaz and Manasseh, as they turned their backs on God, both of them burnt their own sons alive to the Canaanite daughter of Moab. Similar practices occurred in Europe, while the Aztecs and Mayans of Central America took the practice to uh, most appallingly, ripping out beating hearts while people were starving. In India, in addition to abortion and infanticide of girls, was the practice of sooty. Sooty is where a wife would either voluntarily or be forced to jump on the burning funeral pyre of her husband in a last act of devotion. At great risk, Irish missionary Amy Carmine brought hundreds of young Indian girls into her care who would otherwise have ended up as prostitutes in Hindu temples. Foot binding tortured women in China for centuries until the missionary Gladys Alb arrived and strove to stop that. She also set up uh, orphanages and uh, was trying to work for prison reform in China as well. All these horrific things were thankfully wound back as Christianity, which valued all people made in the image of God, spread throughout the world. As the author said, it's been one of the most powerful forces for good in history, of the most. And yet, sadly, despite that, many Western societies with a Christian heritage like ours are throwing that life affirming legacy away. Over a million babies are buried in the United States each year alone. And cases of babies now being abandoned are on the increase. Girls are still targeted in the womb, particularly in China and in India. Therefore, the work of continuing to affirm life needs to continue going on. We need to be informed and aware of the laws coming before our parliaments that either affirm life or would degrade it. And yet tragically, just within the last three years, all the states in Australia now allow for abortion up until birth. I've talked about the horrific stories of babies being wheeled into storms until they stop crying. A different way, so we need to be informed about these things, a different way to value human rights and bring about encouragement is to go to prisonalert.com. Pretty simple thing, prisonalert.com. And there you can get information about Christian prisoners. They're locked up, you can get their address and you can write to them. And you'll encourage them, or if the letter doesn't quite reach them, at least the authorities in the prison are aware that people outside know about this prison. And perhaps some of their uh, care might be raised up. There are so many Christian organisations that come from that Christian worldview, Christian blind mission, the leprosy mission, so many others continue their great work of treating people made in God's image because they are precious, even though their societies so often abandon them. Yet all this flows from the gospel in that first chapter in Genesis. Christianity changed the world in valuing life, 
But as societies turn away from God, they are losing that precious value. This can be illustrated in a rather interesting and true story that occurred during World War II. On a remote island in the Pacific, an American serviceman met one of the na local natives who could read, and he was carrying a Bible. Upon seeing the Bible, the soldier said to him, we educated people, no one will put much faith in that book. The Christian native was from a tribe who not long ago were cannibals. So he replied to the soldier, well, it's good for you that we follow the Bible or you would have been eaten by it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You are gracious and amazing word reserved for us. We thank you for those verses in Genesis 1 that we are made in your image. And as we consider that, the consequences for that are limitless. And we thank you, Lord, that our forebears and people today, through those verses and many others in the Bible, verses of affirming life, Verses of Jesus blessing children. Verses of Jesus embracing lepers, healing the mind, healing. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' life. We see his life concerns. We ask that you all cause us to think more deeply about how we treat like the many people that we cannot How we might be informed of how we might help in some way with these organisations and so many others doing such a great thing. Pray these things because they glorify you. Um, did we? Oh, we have a question. So I did hear a thing halfway through. He's wrong. Yeah, is that really a comment? That's what I In fact, so it's still practiced in many countries around the world. It certainly is. Actually, it hasn't quite been taken away, you'd have to say with the current laws, it's happening here. <laughs> In fact, I was going to mention it, but you've got to edit lots out. Um, it just last year in California, uh, you may have heard about it, a controversial bill got passed that uses the term perinatal, which I, th I think I've got that right, Vanessa might know, but th that's an ambiguous word. But basically what this, this word in this bill was allowing children, um, and even using the word cure is probably too strong a language, but it would have allowed babies to die up until the first 30 days of life without prosecution. Put it that way. Now, it was, there was a whole lot of protest about it um, in Sacramento, State Parliament, California, um, and there were amendments made to that bill. But still, it's there uh, in various forms. So, so now I think it's that any injury caused in utero, um, a person cannot be sued, so watched abortions and things like that. Um, it's pretty good. The detail, I didn't do it because it's quite detailed, 
but it's pretty horrific that, that uh, Keith made that comment that it is practiced. And the more we move from good, the more the culture of death invades our society. Seven. 